go to the link on the nafinet.org page as shown in the slide. Well, we hope you enjoy this program. I will join you at the end for more tips on how to get the most from this program. Now it's my honor to introduce your presenters for this course, Brandon Seltz and Mark Thompson. So hey everybody, so thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, again, I'm Brandon Seltz, I am a pilot, I'm a game designer and founder of Take Flight Interactive. Uh, I grew up playing simulations and games uh, and ended up working as a game designer on Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, and I'm, we applied the rules of game design to flight sim to make flying fun for millions. And I'm really proud to say that we introduced millions of people to flying, many of whom uh, took that to an exciting career in aviation. Uh, and then again at Redbird, we, um, we applied the rules of game design to real world training at Curricula to great effect. And we helped develop their gift program. Um, we founded Take Flight in 2015 and uh, uh, with a group of developers that I've been working with since Microsoft. Uh, and we're now applying those rules of game design to new simulation methods uh, and really hope to revolutionize the way we use simulation today. And after four years of R&D, uh, we've built a clean slate AI training platform that we'll talk about here a little bit later. And so um, I feel like I've been practicing my whole life to build this technology. Um, when I started my flight training, uh, I remember taking off for the first time and looking out over the wing and thought, my gosh, I've done this a million times. And I went on to get my pilot's license in minimum time and minimum cost. And I was amazed at how valuable my time spent on low cost simulation had been. And so I've really been on this path to uncover the latent value in simulation ever since. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Thompson. I'm a certified flight instructor working at Rainier Flight Service in Renton. That's in, near the Seattle area in Puget Sound. Uh, like most pilots, I have a story about uh, being bit by the flying bug very, at a very young age. I was probably about six years old, uh, sitting in an airplane in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and uh, enjoying getting stuck back in the seat, and a few hours later being on the West Coast visiting my grandparents in Victoria, BC, Canada. Uh, shortly after earning my driver's license, I started driving to the local airport in Gimli, Manitoba, home of the famed Gimli Glider, if you're familiar with that Air Canada airplane that ran out of fuel halfway across Canada shortly after the conversion to the metric system. That's where I learned to fly. Uh, fortunately, I did not run out of fuel during my flight training. And I uh, made it all the way through earning my private license uh, just after I turned 18 in 1995. At that point, I got a little scared. I was I'd always wanted to learn how to fly. Uh, and I was determining my career at the age of 18. I decided that take a step back from flying I had to earn my degree knowing that if I wanted to fly professionally I would need to have a degree. Uh, I went to University of Manitoba for two years where I, I learned a lot socially. I uh, didn't earn a degree but I uh, had a lot of fun in the process. Stepped back from that. I did a couple of years of aircraft maintenance for a flying fishing lodge in northern Manitoba. But being around airplanes all that time made me just want to get back in them. So. I decided to make the trip down to UND, which was a short drive, three hours from home, University of North Dakota, where I went to school there earning my undergraduate in 2003, uh, master's in 2005. My CFI in 2003, and instructed actively at, the U at UND for uh, three years. I then got a job out in Seattle working for a company called Navaris, designing RMP AR, Navigation Approach Procedures for Airlines, and had the opportunity to travel around the world implementing those procedures in China, Southeast Asia, Australia, and all over my home country, Canada. Uh, in 2015, I decided to get back into flying actively. The airlines were hiring, and I wanted to get back into flying actively. I decided to get back into flight instruction to uh, get my skills back up to speed. I was immediately struck at how much things had changed uh, in the nine years since I'd actively instructed. Uh, G1000 aircraft were everywhere and the iPad was ubiquitous. Every pilot had an iPad. Historically, the challenge for pilots was finding the information they needed. The new challenge I quickly discovered was sifting through all the information to get to the useful pieces of data. Technology certainly was an improvement, but it had also changed the challenge of instruction and flight training. And that's where I was also introduced to Brandon at Take Flight Interactive. So, there's a lot we can learn from games. Uh, gamification is, uh, and game-based learning is a huge market, 
and it's growing fast, and there's a really good reason for that. You know, games aren't just frivolous activities, but they're highly designed systems meant to create engagement. And I think you'll find through this presentation that the me mechanisms that games use to create that engagement maps very well to flight training. And so we'll learn how you can use game design uh, to help you engage your students in new uh, and interesting ways. And if we can make flight training fun and engaging, we'll get more pilots to certification. And that engagement will also help learning retention, skill acquisition, uh, and, and, and uh, which ends up making safer pilots. And we'll also take a look at how game theory and the technology uh, that we're using in the simulation space can really help training as well as the training business. We can all agree that flight training is one of the safest activities out there uh, in, in flying. We're looking to make that even safer by giving pilots more opportunities to experience aeronautical decision making in flight. So we'll teach them the basic skills uh, on the simulator and then allow them to exercise their aeronautical decision making in the aircraft. You know, when I got my private license, we spent so much of the time going back and forth to the practice area and really focusing on the maneuvers and practicing for the test that by the time I got my, uh, my private pilot license, I really didn't feel capable enough to utilize all those privileges. Uh, and I think we can spend much more time operating in the system uh, using ADM to make better pilots. And so that's my vision going forward is to, uh, to, to make it better for everyone coming after me. Okay, so while fun isn't the goal in training, maintaining a high level of engagement is critical to knowledge transfer and retention. And I find that understanding the fundamentals of game design is incredibly effective in everyday life. Um, I've got two small children at home and have to rely on it all the time. Uh, I think the classic example of using game design in everyday life is screaming out at the pool, last one in is a rotten egg. Uh, and you can just see all the kids running with so much more urgency than they had the moment before. Uh, I know I can ask my kids to brush their teeth over and over again and not get nothing out of it, uh, but as soon as I challenge them to see who the first one is to brush their teeth, uh, they're fighting to get into the bathroom. And so these kind of principles uh, can be used to, mo to motivate anyone in almost any situation. And don't just take my word for it. You know, gamification is a huge market. Um, Game-based learning tools, uh, corporate training, uh, even retail outlets are starting to use gamification. And the U.S. Department of uh, Commerce states that $27.7 trillion market by 2020. Uh, and I know I see this increase in my, in my kids' classrooms as well as uh, places I visit online. Uh, so game-based learning, uh, oh, in, uh, a recent study on games, I'm sorry, uh, shows us how incredibly these new learning tools are. Not only did introduce in game-based learning uh, increase student retent or student uh, satisfaction by 85 percent, it increased scores and completion rates by 81 percent, and also overwhelmingly improved retention of the course material by 73 percent. And so, why does game-based learning work so well? In general, it's because we learn best by doing, and it's it's learning by doing that makes that skill acquisition so sticky. You know, it's good old trial and error, figuring things out on your own. And a big part of this is having context for the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, like the picture here, you know, I bet this kid didn't do that again. Ultimately, we're built to play, and we learn a lot from that play. I have heard that flight training is like learning from a fire hose. I guess that That's keeps true. A, a little That's too literally. True. That's right. And having context uh, for the knowledge is extremely important. And I thought this illustration is a, is a really good example of that. Yeah, I really do love this this picture here. We can imagine uh, in the flight training environment, the ground school and the flight training are quite often separated where a student may go through a ground school in advance of flight training, and they learn all this knowledge, which the picture on the left shows you. So they have all these blobs of knowledge, maybe without context. And once they get in the airplane, uh, we see this experience add some context for the knowledge that they learn on that left image. So now they have these, these aha moments of connecting the dots, if you will. And so what is a game? Um, a game is a system which players overcome challenge that's bound by a set of rules and has a quantifiable outcome. And just reading that definition, we see how well that relates to flight training excel itself. Um, we have systems like airspace, uh, and aircraft systems themselves. Uh, flying itself is challenging. Um, and 
you know, there's, well, we have plenty of rules, put it that way. And then obviously there's quantifiable outcome. All right, so as we look at the different uh, elements here that Brandon was talking about with systems, challenge, and rules, uh, the systems, of course, we have aircraft systems, and airspace itself is a system the students need to learn and understand. The challenge, well, flying isn't easy. It is a challenge, and even when not training, when we're on the ground thinking about flying, just the thought of how do we get the outcome we're looking for. Rules, as Brandon mentioned, we have a lot of rules. That uh, far aim book is pretty thick and makes a nice thud when it hits the desk. And quantifiable outcomes. Well, the ACS, the Airman Certification Standard, provides that for us, the standard to which we'll be held at the end of training. Obviously, the number one goal is to have a safe flight, but we do need to meet those standards in order to become a safe, competent pilot. So games are generally organized into what we call a game loop. Uh, it starts with a challenge, something that you can't do yet. And then through trial and error, you gain context for the problem space. And then you figure it out. And it's really in that aha moment where the power lies. It's where all of those things that you've knowledge, uh, all of that knowledge and context you've gained really comes together, much like Mark was talking about as far as the ground school goes. Um, and then comes mastery and reward. You know, in most games, the reward is arbitrary. Uh, but in our game, luckily, mastery is flight. And so at Take Flight, we use uh, this game loop to deconstruct flight maneuvers to give the students all the information necessary to arrive at those aha moments themselves. Um, and like you'll learn, you can do the same thing in the airplane. <clears throat> Next slide, all right, good. Uh, so game mechanics um, are basically elements that games are made from. And you can think of these mechanics as tools in your toolbox for creating engagement. Uh, one of the most, since since uh, game design is all about challenge and overcoming challenge, it makes sense that difficulty is one of the main levers we have to create engagement. Uh, uh, if a challenge is too hard, the student will find it frustrating. If it's too easy, they'll find it boring. But if we can get them operating in this ideal level of challenge, then it creates an energized level of focus called being in the zone or flow. And by creating a rhythm of successes, we can actually create motivation to take on that next, most, uh, next more advanced challenge. And I'm sure you've all known people addicted to games. I might have become addicted to a game every once in a while myself, uh, but I'm confident we can bring the same level of engagement to training. Okay, so the, there are many game design mechanics which we can use to create engagement and fun. And I think you'll see that these map very well to the flight training regime. Right, and I'm sure as flight instructors, you're going to recognize a lot of these concepts. They may have different names, uh, but if you read the fundamentals of instruction, you read the instru Aviation Instructor's Handbook, you're probably using a lot of these elements already and just didn't recognize it. So one of the first things we'll talk about is, is not generally considered a mechanic. It's more like a framework, but it's called the interest curve. And it's a structure of varying tension uh, used to maintain and build engagement. Uh, they're heavily used in movies. Most every movie you see uh, uses the same, almost the same shape of interest curve. Uh, and here we have the interest curve for Star Wars A New Hope. And we see that it spikes initially with the capture of the rebels on the Star Destroyer. It dips down uh, and rests as we have a couple moments of character development. We meet Luke's family. Um, Luke's family's killed. We meet Obi-Wan. Um, Alderaan is destroyed. And then, um, you know, there's periods of rest between all of these until finally uh, you know, there's the trench run at the end and blow up the Star Destroyer uh, or the Death Star, okay. and everything's great. I think you lost me at Alderaan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, when Brandon mentioned the interest curve concept to me a couple of years ago at Oshkosh. It really, I, I had an aha moment where I was like, I could really see where this would apply in flight training. I think all too often we do a really good job of spiking the interest curve early on with that discovery flight, but then it quickly gets boring as we dive into ground school and, and trips back and forth to the practice area. I think as Brandon will describe here, we can do a lot of work to help with that. I think the thing to take away from the interest curve is, is that A, it's a, it's a rhythm. There are moments of rest between uh, peaks of tension, and also it builds as you go along. Uh, if we look at an interest curve as it's mapped to current day flight training, we see that it's not ideal. You start with a ton of interest and excitement, and then you get into ground school. 
And it could be weeks or even months before you get back to that same level of excitement that you had when you came in. And then you get into the air work and it's really fun uh, until you feel like you're still doing air work. And, and when you're still practicing air work, you're feeling like you're not progressing. I have a feeling that's when a lot of people look at the costs and how much fun they're fly, uh, having and, uh, and call it quits. Uh, and of course, the end of the flight training is great. There's a huge up and down when it gets to the later stage checks. Uh, the oral might be a downer, but then you've got, uh, you've obviously got your check ride and your license arrives. Uh, if we remap some of these things and look at flight training uh, in uh, the way we could arrange flight training in a slightly more ideal interest curve, we see that by interleaving the most engaging parts, the flying, with some of the less fun parts, maybe the ground school, uh, that we really can create a much more fun and engaging program overall. And so I'll quickly go through a few of these game mechanics uh, and how they apply to training. I'm going to leave, lean heavily on Mark about how he uses these in the airplane. Um, but surprise, you know, surprise is something unexpected and there's really nothing like surprise to kind of perk somebody up or, or whip them back into shape when they're not quite paying attention. Yeah, I think we all of us have been on the practice area with a student who was riding along, not really paying attention, not looking for a place to land. And you pull the power and it certainly gets their attention. Uh, and I bet on the next flight that student comes prepared to handle that emergency, looking for places to land and being prepared to run that checklist. Another one we use quite frequently would be unplanned diversions. We're heading out to the practice area for what would be a normal maneuver flight and we decide to pop into that local airport. It forces the student to really focus on knowing the material on the, on the charts. Some happen more naturally, like students are coming into land and you know, there's that, you know, that busload of nuns on the runway that forces the student to do a go around that they weren't expecting to do. The key here is not letting the student get too comfortable in what they think they know, but rather exposing them to some situations that force them to react a little bit more quickly. Another mechanic that's, uh, that's popular is curiosity, and that has allowed the student to follow their own desires to find out more about something. Generally, this is things that don't quite fit on the normal path of the curriculum. Uh, Mark, what are some of the unusual curious things you've done. Yeah, I think, I think as an instructor, this is sometimes where I become the student, where I allow the student themselves to bring in some ideas, some things that they want to explore. Maybe it's a different runway, maybe it's a grass strip they want to go into, maybe it's a mountainous uh, airport. I've also had students who will watch you things on YouTube. I think we've all had students on YouTube looking at all sorts of videos. They'll bring in an idea. For instance, I had one student come in with an idea on how to uh, do some rudder practice, something they'd seen on YouTube. We incorporated that into the lesson. The student learned something, they moved forward, they felt empowered uh, in their own flight training. And I got to learn a new skill that I got to carry on with all my other students. Yeah, I think you touched on an important part, which is allowing them some control over that training. Uh, that does empower them. Uh, so the next mechanic we'll talk about is problem solving. And this is letting that student go through the pro process of answering their own questions. A lot of times this involves them asking themselves questions to get to the end. I think ultimately scenario-based training does incorporate problem solving, forcing the student to use the knowledge that they have to solve a problem that they weren't expecting to uh, be exposed to. Uh, this, this can be introduced too early is what I've seen where sometimes that scenario-based training just isn't relevant. The student can barely control the aircraft uh, and we're giving them some problems about trying to determine what airspace they're flying in or uh, what are the cloud clearance requirements. I think the problem solving skill is best learned uh, after you get the basic motor skills down after the solo, the first solo. So where I see this a lot of times as the stage tech pilot out in the practice area, after the student's solo, we're doing a navigation exercise and the student asks me, uh, what altitude should I climb to or how close am I to that airspace? At that point, I go back to the student and let them make that pilot and command decision because after all, I'm training them to be the pilot and command. Good. Yeah, so clear goals and measures, you know, in some ways, the ACS and the syllabus gives us that, so it's easy. I think, unfortunately, I have seen students, again, showing up on stage checks prior to a check ride, who didn't know what stand they were, they were being held to. So this is really a disservice to the student that they didn't know that the ACS even existed in the first place. I show it to them and then they have an aha moment of, oh, that's why my instructor uh, yells at me when I don't <laughs> hold my altitude plus or minus 100 feet. Uh, this could be a reason why students quit uh, again, this is a quality of instruction issue. We need to make sure the students know how they're going to be evaluated. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is challenging in game design as well. 
it, you find players will feel like they're being scored unfairly, even when the score is a completely objective. And so subjective measures are even easier to dismiss for the students. So this is something to be aware of. And, and uh, there's a strong tendency in some to dismiss the subjective evaluation. So try to keep your evaluations as objective as possible. Right, so we can see some students' defense mechanisms crop, here, crop up here, where their ego may be a little bit too fragile to handle the feedback mm -hmm. we're giving them. Try and stay as objective as possible. Uh, so the next mechanic we'll talk about is uh, meaningful choice. Uh, and that is, uh, oh, sorry, we're going to talk about chance. <laughs> uh, so chance, so the chance is, is something that happens on its own. You know, there's weather, there's no TAMs, there's maintenance issues. Uh, but you can also get a lot out of taking the right chance. We're not, we're not, it's important to be clear here, we're not talking about increasing the risk of a flight. We're talking about taking the opportunities when they exist. Say the weather isn't great, still good enough for a VFR flight, but maybe beyond the student's uh, comfort level. We want to expand their comfort level within the safety of the envelope as it exists. Uh, maybe the opportunity to fly a new type of aircraft where they could gain some exposure there, maybe help them understand the aircraft they're flying even better. Uh, we could have a student plan three different cross countries to get the practice of planning across country without knowing which one they're going to fly that day when they show up. And then depending on the weather, uh, no times and so forth, make a decision of which airport we're going to go fly to. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when, when taking that chance turns out well, it can be incredibly rewarding. And there's also uh, the fact that you learn more on the edges. You know, let's take that iffy weather. You know, next time the student sees the weather, they will be able to have a visual representation of what that looks like when that maybe that temperature and that dew spread, uh, temperature spread come together. And so often it's, uh, it's well worth the effort. And this is a great place to use the simulator as well, mm -hmm. because you can really put the student at the edge of their comfort zone without increasing the risk of the flight. And so now we can talk about meaningful decisions. And so a meaningful choice is one that has an outcome uh, and an, on the end result. Um, and this is an area where, as I mentioned earlier, I sure would have liked to have more experience and more training, um, more opportunity for my decisions to affect the outcome of the flight, not just going back and forth to the practice area. Yeah, I think you're touching on the aeronautical decision-making, which is critical to safety making sure we're exercising the uh, decision-making opportunities as often as possible with go, no-go decisions. Uh, maybe it's a turn back due to the weather. Maybe we do take off into those if your conditions and decide to turn back and having the student recognize when it's beyond their comfort level and turning back. And then there's tons of opportunity during flight planning and cross-country flights. We just need to expose the students to more of it. You know, I thought it was interesting in the Savvy Flight Instructor by Greg Brown how he talks about how recently after getting his CFI, he went on an extended cross country and how much he learned about, uh, about being pilot in command and having that, time, that, that command time under his belt. I can certainly echo that. I know when I was on the flying team at the University of North Dakota, uh, where I learned the most uh, about decision making was on the cross countries to the competitions. I remember one year leaving Grand Forks, heading down to uh, Tennessee for the national competition. Uh, we were over to Iowa, we ran into some unforecast weather, some thunderstorms popped up. We had to make a landing at an airport that we hadn't planned on. We had to do a, a circle, my, my very first circle of land procedure at the base of the clouds with a 25 knot tailwind on final. Uh, and believe it or not, that wasn't the riskiest part of that whole activity. It was deciding whether or not we should get into the 1978 Ford Econoline van at the airport to go to Taco John's that really uh, tested our decision-making skills. Well, good. So. Um, Another interesting mechanic is, is uh, visible progress. You know, every student wants to know how they're doing, uh, how they're progressing toward their goals. And luckily, you know, with flight training, we've got a lot of tools that help us with that already. I think probably the most obvious one is the syllabus that the flight schools use, and most flight schools will have the syllabus in place. Just the process of going through it, checking the boxes, having the student check those boxes to give, again, that ownership of the, of the training gives you an opportunity to discuss how the progress is and that transparency into what they're doing. Uh, with a busy schedule, admittedly, you know, when I'm, when I'm seeing four or five students in a day back to back, this is one of the tougher things as an instructor to do, is provide that meaningful feedback and give them the uh, transparency into their progress. I like that you mentioned letting the student do it. Uh, I think it would have much more, pro uh, much more impact if they could flip the syllabus, they could check the box, uh, it'd be much more meaningful. Uh, so story is another important game mechanic. And obviously, there's scenario-based training. 
And the purpose of scenario-based training is really to get you in the mindset that you can make those decisions. However, it can also be a little contrived if not done well. You know, I know there were several times in my training where, you know, I arrived at some incorrect conclusions because maybe that story didn't, uh, didn't hold water. Uh, you have any anecdotes or guidance on I think, as training? I touched on earlier, I think the scenario-based training is, is really effective, can be really effective if introduced properly and at the right time in training. If it happens too early, it can certainly lead to frustration if the student doesn't have the knowledge or skills to make a meaningful decision. Uh, but where we generally see that scenario-based training lead up to is the oral portion of the, uh, the flight evaluation for their actual certificate. And then the, once you get into the air, it really does get to be maneuvers-based. So knowing that, uh, as instructors, we want to do those scenarios prior to the, the check ride so the student has the experience knowing how to make those decisions on their own. You know, interestingly, story is somewhat controversial in game design as well. If you weave too tight a narrative, you don't leave the possibility for multiple outcomes. And this kind of goes back to that meaningful decisions and meaningful choices. Uh, you, you know, so when you create stories or scenarios, try to leave them open-ended so that the student's decisions really do have an outcome on the end of the, uh, on the uh, end of the lesson. Uh, let's see. So the last game mechanic we'll talk about here is reward. Um, and it's simply recognizing someone's effort uh, or achievements. Um, Mark, what do, you, what do you do for rewards? It, it can be as simple as a great job today. I think everybody likes to hear that what they did on that flight was what they were supposed to do and that worked out well. Uh, at our flight school, we put up photos on, on the, online uh, showing they're solid or they've certified, we got the certification. Another popular one at our flight school is heading up to Port Townsend to the Jefferson County Airport. They've got a little restaurant there called the Spruce Goose Cafe. Aircraft, uh, aircraft and memorabilia everywhere. And Brandon's been there. They have a, they're well known for their pie. Uh, and using that as a reward for students. If this, after this flight, if this goes well, how about our next flight? We just go take a nice flight up to Jeffco and have some pie. And that could also be one of those valleys after after you know that the student had a difficult lesson the time before. That's a good that's a good valley or time for rest uh, going back to the interest curve. You know, I know when I was doing my private pilot training, um, when it got time to do my long cross country, uh, I really wanted to fly down the Washington coast. I had been camping and hiking out there and, and just remember seeing small planes fly by and thinking, you know what, I want to do that. Uh, and so um, my instructor signing me off to do that trip, if, if you're not aware with the north, uh, northwest side of Washington, uh, it's fairly rural out there, so I had to get some sign off to do that. But uh, you know, it was a real dream come true to fly down the coast with my arm over the seat looking at all the places that I had camped and hiked. And so that's definitely the highlight of my private pilot training. Probably tasted even sweeter after all those approvals you had to get. Yeah, well, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. Um, so, you know, to summarize, uh, you know, understanding the game design basics and those mechanics that make up games give you a set of tools uh, that you can use to keep your students engaged. Uh, like any good game designer, you should be watching your students and, and asking yourself, are they having fun? What can I do to maximize their level of engagement? Are they bored? Are they frustrated? And I think that you'll find that with these mechanics, you can have a huge influence on that. If your students are more engaged, <clears throat> they're far more likely to reach certification. By applying mechanics like meaningful choices, problem solving, you can help exercise that aeronautical decision making even more than you are today resulting in more capable and safer pilots. So if you guys are interested uh, in the game design concepts, uh, there are some really good books out there. Um, the one on the left, uh, The Theory of Fun by Raf Koster, is a really quick read. You could get through this in an evening or a weekend. Uh, and it really is just the, the nuts and bolts, no nonsense, how to create fun. Um, the Art of Game Design is a little more academic uh, it's a thicker book, but it is one that I find myself coming back to over and over again. You know, Brandon turned me on to that book, and it really is quite engaging. And there's also a free app called A Deck of Lenses, which is a great way to get familiar with some more of those game mechanics. And finally, what video games have to teach us about uh, learning and literacy by uh, James Paul Gee was very influential for me. Uh, it gives real insight into the power of games and how, and how effective they are in everyday life. Uh, well, good. So we talked a little bit earlier about what we're up to at Take Flight um, and how we're using these elements of game design to create new tools uh, in simulation. And we recently demoed for the Navy, which went really, really well. And we're also working with uh, organizations like the EAA, uh, Civil Air Patrol, and several large universities. And so 
you know, interestingly, the message that we hear from all of those groups are very similar, that we need more accessibility to training and that, it's, it, and that there's a real rarity of great CFIs. And so we're trying to fill that gap. Uh, and so I thought I'd show you a little bit about what we're up to. Uh, interestingly, it was, it was Greg Brown who suggested we do this talk tonight. Uh, I've known Greg for a long time. He's been really influential uh, for us at Take Flight. Uh, in 1999, he wrote an article for NAFI called Tomorrow's Lesson, where he talked about the smart simulator with automated instruction, uh, and that those simulators had infinite patience and consistency and could really increase the standardization within flight training uh, and, and how this uh, technology could increase uh, the pilot development throughput. Um, but he also mentioned to never lose sight of the human element of flight training. So I want to be clear that that's, uh, that's not our goal. Uh, so Greg also had a very uh, interesting quote. I think this is out of Savvy Flight Instructor, or maybe that article. And he said, it's tempting to be skeptical of untried technologies, but we must be visionary in ass assessing, adopting, and accepting them. And so we're working hard at Take Flight on the first two. You know, we are developing this and we are adapting it. Um, you know, and I would ask all of you to be open to assessing it uh, and accepting it. So the power of the modern day PC is really pretty incredible. Uh, it supports very realistic simulation. Uh, the screenshot you see here is a Cessna 172 panel that I run on my little laptop. Uh, and every switch, knob, and button works. It flies incredibly realistically. And of course, there's better transfer, the bigger, more expensive sims. But you know, one of our goals is to really increase accessibility to training. And as we see it, as good as simulators are these days, no matter how big, they are missing one major component. And that's the ability to not just facilitate training, but also to deliver that training in a new and engaging way. And there's obviously no uh, replacement for human instruction. Um, but if we can do more learning in the sim, then we can use the aircraft for more advanced concepts uh, and ultimately create more safer pilots. Um, so by combining elements of game design, as we've discussed, artificial intelligence and data analytics, We've, com we've combined those to create a virtual instructor. And again, there's no replacement for the human element there. Uh, but you, as a CFI, can think of this virtual instructor as a teaching assistant, which makes you a professor. Uh, as my friend Jeff Van West said, this technology can transform the instructor from teacher to mentor. Um, you can think of this technology as an overlay for standard simulation or legacy simulation that lets pilots interact with and learn directly from the sim. And we hope that this can fundamentally change the way pilots and organizations use simulation and hopefully for the students to uh, change the economics of flight trainings for the better. Uh, so I will quickly walk through um, our product called Take Flight Academy so you can see how it works. Um, so the first thing you do is log in uh, and you will see an on-sim curriculum. So it shows your past performance where you need to improve or what lesson you need to do next. Uh, the little green bars under the maneuver tiles there are your high score. Uh, and all your process, uh, progress and performance data is stored in the cloud. So you could use it at home uh, or at the flight school and, and pick up right where you left off. And so in this example, we'll select the maneuver on the top left, intro flight. And you see a very brief, well, briefing. Uh, we keep it short, nobody reads anymore. Um, so really, we just go through the basics of what you're going to need to know for that scenario. And when I click Fly Now, uh, I'm presented with three different scenarios. Um, our lessons are broken up into three parts. Uh, there is a training scenario that has full instruction, full feedback to really teach you how to perform the maneuver. Um, and of course, there's scoring at the end. And, the, and then an evaluation scenario without the instructions and feedback to make sure that you can do it on your own. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, scenario uses the same scoring as the training lesson does. Uh, and then there's a challenge, which is a fun uh, or real world example of the skills that you learned in the training scenario. Um, so in this example, I'll select, select the training scenario. And when I do, it immediately launches the sim. So the flight is pre-configured, ready to fly. There's no messing about with the sim. Uh, we handle all of that for you. Uh, this maneuver starts much like any first flight in the airplane would. Um, the instructor's flying, telling you the basics. Uh, and just so you know, any text you see printed on screen is what you would hear uh, in your headphones uh, throughout the scenario. So you can think of this 
uh, virtual instructor as, as sitting in the sim next to you. But we didn't have to go to the practice area. Right? We didn't have to free flight, take off, or fly to the practice area. <laughs> Um, so after transferring the, the flight controls to, to the user, the virtual instructor asks you to pitch up and then responds when you do. Um, and if you pitched up too much or not enough, you'd get a different response here. So this isn't, these aren't canned responses. Uh, so this particular scenario walks you through all of the flight controls uh, and their effects on the aircraft. And so in this way, students can really start at level one and work their, all the, work their way up on their own. And this is auditory and visual feedback? Yeah, so the, the image you see on the left there, they've pitched up, and so it's showing them that as they raise the nose without increasing throttle, they're also slowing down. Um, so let's see, yeah, and so once you finish the training scenario, uh, you'll fly the challenge to really put those new skills to use. Um, as you can see, we've added fun visual elements in the environment to challenge the user. There's this hoop course here, as Brandon mentioned. It's really interesting to watch new students work through this hoop course not long after doing the intro flight uh, training and evaluation. The students are quite erratic at first, where they're really focusing on trying to force the airplane through the hoops. But as they realize that smoother control inputs are better uh, and their improvements, and as they fly through that last hoop for the first time, watching the smile on the face is pretty cool. And so all of our scenarios are scored. Um, scoring provides uh, you know, strong feedback for how well you're doing, but it also challenges you to do it better the next time. Uh, and it also, maybe even most importantly, shows you where you can improve. Um, we'll, we'll see a, a slightly more detailed score in here in just a second. Um, so let's look at an example of a, of a, of a maneuver that's further down the, the private pilot curriculum. We'll look at steep turns. And so I'll select steep turns, and I'm immediately in the airplane, ready to start. Uh, the virtual instructor can describe the maneuver, demonstrate the maneuver, uh, and then hands you the aircraft controls. And as you turn into the maneuver, uh, let's say the nose starts to drop, um, the virtual instructor can give you instructions and feedback on your performance. So here she points out that you're getting a little low uh, and to add some back pressure. Uh, and that kind of feedback, there's a lot of variation in it. Um, at first, we, we tell you that your nose is low, and then we tell you what to do to correct that. And then if they still continue nose low, then we, we vary exactly how they can, uh, they can raise the nose. And then ultimately, when you roll out of your steep turn, you immediately see a score. Um, and so this score screen uh, is a little more ACS focused. 70% uh, is passing or within standard. Uh, and if we look at the score from left to right, that's basically a timeline uh, of the maneuver. And then if we step down through the metrics we're using, uh, just like the ACS, we're measuring bank angle, airspeed, altitude, rollout heading, and coordination. Uh, and something interesting here, if you guys can see it, is that there, there's correlation going on between the scores. Um, on this score, or on, yeah, on this the first turn there, uh, my bank got too high, uh, my altitude dropped, my airspeed increased. And so it's obvious looking at my score that if I could have kept my bank angle more in line, then I would have come out with a better maneuver overall. And then ultimately, when I hit try again, uh, I'm right back into the maneuver. And so I can rinse and repeat this as much as possible. You know, here in Seattle, I could probably do 30 steep turns before I could drive to the airport with the kind of traffic that we have. And so, uh, next slide, John. And so we have some, some great evidence that uh, that this mating of game design and real-world flight instruction truly works. Um, we have some research projects coming up this summer that we're really excited about uh, with the JAROTC, as well as some major universities that are going to yield some really great data. Uh, but we did participate in a program with Alaska Airlines called Solo Academy, where we took uh, uh, several um, high school students with no aviation um, uh, experience whatsoever, and we ran them through um, Sim scenarios on the simulator before getting them in, into the airplane, and the res results were really dramatic. Uh, you know, after completing the first three scenarios in the sim, they were able to get in the airplane and fly everything but the liftoff and the touchdown on their discovery flight. Uh, and they climbed out of the aircraft beaming because they realized that on the, the first time they had ever flown the airplane, that they could go that they could do it. Uh, and they really approached the training with confidence from there on out because they knew if they could do it in the sim they could do it in the airplane. Uh, here's some data from a student learning takeoffs. And uh, we see that it only took five tries to go from below ACS standards to well above ACS. Um, 
And when he got in the airplane, the instructor noted that, that it was like he had several hours in the aircraft already. And so this time on the sim really equaled hours in the aircraft in the eyes of the instructor. And uh, these students soloed 40% faster than those not using tape flight. Uh, the average solo time at the flight school is 25, and using the sim integrated curriculum, uh, these kids soloed at 15. Right, and this really made you believe rather than me. This, this is a picture of me cutting the shirt tails off one of those solo students after his first solo. Uh, this student is now, we talk about worrying about students getting to certification. This student is now, you know, two and a half years later, just started flight instructing at the flight school where I work. So yeah, I mean, we understand that solo time isn't a be all end all metric, uh, but it really is interesting that they were more capable in the aircraft. Um, and so we're working with EAA uh, to bring take flight to, to the young eagles. Uh, we created a kind of a, t, a, a version of this specifically tuned for the teen demographic. And that's been a really good success. Um, here's a picture here of it at Air Venture at Oshkosh. Um, and the, engaging, the engagement take flight creates is pretty obvious. We had folks coming back over and over here. Um, and I can't tell you how many times we heard a pilot say, boy, I sure wish I had this when I was learning to fly. Uh, so that's great validation for us. And we've also run a very successful trial with the CAP. Uh, this is a group in Naples, Florida, uh, obviously engaged in the program there. And now they're using Take Flight in their, uh, their training program with great effect. And so, you know, the next, we all know how important it is to reach this next generation of aviators. And it's one of the reasons that I'm so proud of the work we're doing with EAA and Civil Air Patrol. You know, in our experience, this new generation uh, is really accepting of new technology. Uh, they're not afraid of it. You know, they're already playing games. So they might as well be playing something that gives them a real world skill. Um, and obviously it greatly increases their access to flight training. Um, Take Flight is, is uh, being used at the Museum of Flight uh, where their ground school class goes into the sim laboratory once a week and uses Take Flight. And it really is pretty amazing to sit and watch 25 students all on their own learning maneuvers, improving and moving up the curriculum with one CFI in the room who's simply standing back, answering questions, noting high scores. And some of the feedback from those kids taking this to the airplane uh, is fantastic. Um, we had a strong snow here in February called Snowmageddon. That's relative. It is shadow. Uh, that's true. Not for Winnipeg. Just to... <laughs> yeah, right. It locked us down. Uh, and this student said that after two weeks of not flying in the airplane, he came back sharp because he was using tape flight in the meantime. And so there are, um, oh yes, speaking of never too young, uh, this is my son Grayson. He's six years old. Uh, he loves to soar. And so really it's, it's never too early to instill this, uh, this real sense of fascination of flight. And so... Uh, we know that there, it's common to think simulation isn't good for primary training, that it's better left for instrument work. So I guess this leads us to ask the question, why do we look at the sim for instrument but not for primary training? Uh, we'd be interested in getting some of your opinions in the question and answer period. Uh, is it because it's more procedural, uh, maybe using the autopilot uh, to focus on the instruments? Uh, because that's how we were trained and a lot of instructors teach how they were taught, so that could be part of it. And why now? I think, uh, for me at least, you know, I'm seeing the advances in computing power, uh, the increased visual realism, larger displays, mm -hmm. increase in simulation fidelity, meaning how real realistically it flies, and of course new capabilities with AI and virtual flight instructors. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we understand that there are still limitations of sim usage. You know, it's not a perfect representation of flight, especially with all the senses of flight missing. Um, the main complaint we hear uh, about students using sims uh, solo is that they stare at the instruments. And so we work hard to lessen these effects. Uh, the image that you see here is uh, from straight and level challenge. And in this scenario, we've got this box that shows the vanishing point out there. Uh, and I've been able to maintain plus or minus a couple feet through this whole lesson, uh, not looking at the instruments at all. And so we are making steps to improve these things. So this, this is a powerful image here where this, this vanishing point, the aiming point for a student to actually see where that is over the nose of the airplane. We've also had some not so successful attempts where we maybe had a student who was uh, trying to really plant the landings and trying to get to the root of what that was. It turns out the student was flying the landings uh, scenarios in the, on the sim and we had a line drawn on the runway for a, an aiming point. And the student thought that was the point they needed to put the aircraft down on the runway. And as a primary student pre-solo, uh, we're more concerned about that smooth landing and touchdown within the first thousand feet of the runway. 
Uh, so we, we've since re removed that line from the runway and, and the student's landings improved a lot. Yeah, and so since then, yeah, we've removed the line, we loosened up scoring, we will leave that kind of technology for our spot training, our spot landing scenario. And so here's some of the places that we see benefits for the student. Uh, so from a primacy perspective, uh, what's first learned is best learned, best remembered. Uh, so providing the student with that nice standardized way of learning the maneuver that they can repeat as necessary will really help with that, that primacy. Of course, we talked about the increasing availability of training. Uh, students are free to practice at home if they have a simulator. Uh, they can continue training when the weather, the aircraft, and instructor availability might be limited. And there's less skill atrophy, as Brandon mentioned, with that student during snowmageddon uh, during flight training delays. You know, one of the things that I, I really hope that we can do is shift some of the time flying back and forth to the practice area, working on those maneuvers, to time flying cross-country in the system, practicing and exercising that ADM. And if we can use the aircraft for more advanced maneuvers uh, and, and concepts, such as correlating that knowledge uh, that they learned in ground school, uh, then we will arrive at more qualified pilots upon certification, which is also more safer pilots as well. And uh, obviously having more confidence in the airplane and being successful towards your goals in flight training is simply more fun. Uh, and there's some benefits for the flight instructor as well. Interestingly, I think they map very closely to the benefits for the student. Right, again, again, primacy is right up front and center. Overcoming primacy is probably one of the most difficult things that we may have to do as an instructor. We've all had students that have flown with other, other instructors uh, who they didn't match well with. Uh, they show up, we're trying to work with them and they have these uh, skills and habits that are, are really well, too well ingrained, and having to uh, uncork those can be really challenging. The sim, again, standardized across the board can really help with that. Yeah, I, you know, I think, imagine getting in, into an aircraft with a student who already st understood the procedure to take off. Uh, they understood the sight picture, uh, rudder usage, trim, and now you're able to talk about more advanced things like the airspace, like the situational awareness, uh, and so those are the ways that, that uh, well, and radio communications is a big one. And so that's ways that we think we can, we can get students uh, further along before certification. And in, uh, increasing completion ratio, you know, is good for everybody. Um, so, you know, that's one of the major levers that we hope to pull as well. And we're also interested to know if you think a more effective simulator that a student could use independently would increase the number of students that you could train over a given day month or year. We'd like to discuss that again during the question and answer period. If we have time, we're running no, out. That's true. We'll hurry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's benefits to the flight school as well. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, higher student success is going to equal a happier customer. Uh, and in today's world of social media, you know, word of mouth is seen by everyone. So having, having successful students uh, can really drive the success of a business. Um, and the simulator can also uh, deliver higher profit margins. Uh, we're currently working with some manufacturers of some great new AATDs, and the business model around a SIM-integrated curriculum uh, really gives you not only the opportunity to lower the cost for a student, but also increase the profits for a flight school. Um, and if that, you know, if that means you can train when the weather, weather isn't conducive to flying, then that's great. I guess, yeah, historically, the simulator has been viewed as a rainy day activity, but we, and we can still fill the void. There is demonstrated value in integrating the SIM more tightly into the curriculum. Meaning that uh, a student could do it in the sim first and be far more along when they get into the airplane. Um, and also it provides more consistent revenue. Uh, you know, it, it evens out those peaks and valleys. And I've heard a lot of flight schools really uh, wanting to get to a fixed price model. And while we're not there quite yet, you know, ultimately we will be able to provide detailed reports of student progress in the sim so that those organizations can, can be better manage uh, their training as a whole. Uh, there's a, there's a, oh, so you might be asking, how can I integrate this tool? Well, it's really not necessary to modify your curriculum uh, to use Take Flight. Uh, our lessons are guided by the ACS, uh, so you can really use it to familiarize students sorry, uh, before they get started on their lessons, and you could also use it as homework uh, and, before a specific maneuver. And, and I have done that. I've also used it as a tool that helps analyze students' uh, progress or plateaus. Mm -hmm. They've reached a point where they're not making any more progress. We jump on the sim, we run through an evaluation, it gives them a score, and it allows me to see where they were challenged in that flight. And regarding what you need to get started, uh, you know, it's a PC, 
flight controls, um, and the simulation software. Uh, we're compatible with Lockheed Martin's prepared 3D right now. We are working toward X-Plane compatibility. And I don't want to get into too much technical details here, uh, but you can always reach out to us. We would be happy to help. There's our support email address right there. Uh, we've got a detailed getting started guide that might answer a lot of your questions, so feel free to reach out. Uh, and there's a ton of other good simulation tools as well. Um, Pilot Edge comes to mind as, as one of the best training tools out there. Uh, and if you're not familiar, it provides human ATC over the sim, so you can key the mic and get a professional controller on the other side. Uh, you might have seen this recent article by Aviation International News about Bill Forelli, who used Pilot Edge and X-Plane extensively before his training, and he was able to solo in 6.7 hours of focus training uh, after a couple hour, a couple discovery flights. As someone who flies at a busy class Delta airport, it's getting even busier as our flight school gets busier. ATC communications has definitely become one of the bigger challenges for student solo. Well, good. So in conclusion, using game design techniques can help you keep your students engaged and on track to certification. And these new simulation tools can really help transform the training process, getting students to certification with more knowledge, experience, creating safer and more capable pilots. So thanks very much. I'm happy to hear your questions. Would love to see your comments. Uh, you can type those right in the right side there uh, in, the, uh, in the chat window. Can you see some of these? Let's see. Okay, so we're looking at some of the questions here. Uh, do you have anything in a glass cockpit? Uh, yeah, so there are, uh, we don't currently, there are some aircraft coming to market right now with glass cockpits. Um, and some of the sim manufacturers that we're working with will have a glass version as well. So yes, we will be working toward that. Uh, and apologize for leaning in. It's kind of hard for me to see what these are here. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you think about trying this with pilot student or sorry, pilot students who are older, perhaps over forty-five? Uh, we've seen great results with older students. Um, you know, this the you don't have you know you don't have to set it up. It's really easy to use. You basically click a flight maneuver, uh, and the virtual instructor pretty much walks you through everything. So. Yeah, I don't think there's there's an age limit here at all. Um, no, yeah, I've got a number of clients who do use the simulator quite effectively at home on their own. Yeah, and even some that have been flying for a while. I think Mark, you alluded to this, but uh, sometimes you'll see a student that's that's continually having difficulty with something in the airplane, or they've plateaued somewhere, and, and often bringing them back to one of the earlier scenarios, like straight and level, to really work on any trim usage issues and things like that can really be beneficial. And I've had students who resisted it, but once they get on there. They get the feedback, they get the scores, they get kind of addicted to getting that high score. They really want to try and get that a score. To good games. Spot. Yeah. So let's see, do you have any other questions here? Uh, okay. Which sims for instrument rating would you recommend? Oh gosh, for an instrument rating, you know, I would say pick which kind of avionics that you're looking for. Um, you know, the simulators these days are, are all very capable. Um, Lockheed Martin's prepared 3D, uh, X-Plane, I know that X-Plane does have a quite capable G1172 in the box, so I might suggest X-Plane for that. Uh, so this is mostly focused on flight training, it seems. Have you integrated this into ground school courses as well? Ah, we would love to. Um, you know, we, we're getting there uh, one step at a time. Uh, the briefing page that we looked at is the perfect space uh, to add some ground school content. I do think it's very important that we do integrate ground school more into the, the flight training curriculum instead of doing them separately just for these context issues that we've talked about. And so, yeah, Mark and I have, uh, have a lot of really good ideas on how uh, you can pose questions and quizzes to actually unlock new scenarios so that students would have to go through the ground portion before they got to fly. Yes. And there's a comment. I think the virtual instructor is key to the primacy factor. I've flown with students who clearly have a lot of sim time that have practiced some skills in a very wrong manner. Mm -hmm. This is huge. I couldn't agree more. I've, I've had numerous students uh, show up at the flight school with lots of sim time, unguided, uncontained, and uh, primacy. Again, it's tough to unwind that and get them to a place where they're, they may have some of the stick and rudder skills, but a lot of the uh, airmanship 
the knowledge is, is simply not there and they're applying the skill incorrectly. So I couldn't agree more. You know, I remember back to how I was using the sim uh, before uh, I started my flight training and I had all the books and all the manuals and I would read them first and really try to do those maneuvers uh, to the book. And I think that's something that most students maybe don't take it to that level. And so that's why I think it's important that the virtual instructor can really guide them and show them what the standards are and comment when they're not doing it quite right. And things like looking outside, looking at the horizon, we really pay a lot of lip service to that kind of thing. All right, are we, how's our time here? We're, oh, yeah, we are at time. Well, thanks for the questions, everybody. Uh, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Hey, Loretta, your audio is off. You're muted. There we go. <laughs> Hello, I'm Loretta Gandhi. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Leveling up, a game-based approach to pilot development as much as we did presenting it to you. Before you go, here's a few tips on making the most of this program. Turn wings credit for this course by clicking on the button to the right-hand side of your screen that says earn wings credit. This will take you to the FAASafety.gov website to feature the course content and take the mastery quiz for rings credit. Your input helps NAFI provide better benefits and features. And completion of the course valuation earns a chance to win the NAFI 50th anniversary shirt. The Mentor Live page will list the upcoming broadcasts and archive broadcasts. Please feel free to share these links with your students and aviation friends. Thank you again for watching. We look forward to seeing you next month for our Mentor Live broadcast.